Good morning. I shared with you uh, some statistics the other week, the other day. I found some more. This is, uh, I was reminded when I very first became a pastor, and I was working full time, finishing drywall, and I was pastoring a church basically full time, and just going on and on and on. And finally, one day, I, I woke up. I didn't know the name of it, didn't know what it was called, but later I found out it was called Burnout. And I was just basically just uh, was so tired uh, that I just wore myself out. Well, I was looking at the, preparing this message today, I was looking at some statistics for pastors. It says 90% of the pastors report working between 55 to 75 hours per week. 80% believe pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. Many pastors' children do not attend church now because of what the church has done to their parents. 95% of pastors do not regularly pray for their spouses. 33% state that being in the ministry is an outright hazard to their family. 75% report significant stress-related crisis at least once in their ministry. 90% feel they are inadequately trained to cope with the ministry demands. And I can attest to that because when I pastored that first church, I didn't have a clue what I was getting ready to face. Didn't have a clue. Eighty percent of pastors and eighty-four percent of their spouses feel unqualified and discouraged as role of pastors. Ninety percent of pastors said the ministry was completely different than what they thought it would be like before they entered the ministry. And it's not something they prepare you for in seminary. You're just not. Ready for it. Ready for what you're about to face. 50% uh, feel unable to meet the demands of the job. 70% of pastors constantly fight depression. 70% say they have a lower self-image now than when they first started. 70% do not have someone they consider a close friend. 40% report serious conflict with a parishioner at least once a month. 33% confess being involved in inappropriate sexual behavior with someone in the church. 50% of pastors feel so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could, but have no other way of making a living. 75, I mean, 70 percent of pastors feel grossly underpaid. 50% of the ministers start out, will not last five years. That, that's a very disturbing trend to realize. Pastors feel cold the ministry they get in, and because of these other things, they just cannot last. One out of every ten ministers will actually retire as a minister in some form. Only That's only 10%. Go all the way through and actually retire as a pastor. 94% of clergy families feel the pressure of pastor's ministry. 80% of spouses feel the pastor is overworked. 80% of spouses feel left out and underappreciated by church members. 80% of pastor spouses with their spouse, or excuse me, wish their spouse would choose a different profession. 66% of church members expect the minister of family to live at a higher moral standard than themselves. Moral values of a Christian is no different than those who consider themselves as non-Christians. The average, listen to this, the average American will tell 23 lies a day. You all know what Revelation 21 8 says, don't you? Revelation, Revelation 21 8, liars go to hell, liars go to hell. The profession, the profession of pastor is near the bottom of a survey of the most respected professions, just above parcel. That's what is happening and is trending because of all of what's going on. <clears throat> Listen to this statistic. 4,000 new churches begin each year and 7,000 churches close. Over 1,700 pastors left the ministry every month last year. 1,700 a month. You do the, you do the math. 
over 1,300 pastors were terminated by the local church each month, many without cause. Now, I've known many pastors, the same thing, they've been terminated and, and there was really no excuse uh, or no, no reason. They just, and, and I know that there's some churches that do it uh, for financial reasons. Over 3,500 people a day left the church last year. That's not just mentioned. Over 35 people a day. 3,500 people a day left the church last year. Man, that's a lot. Many denominations report an empty pulpit crisis. They cannot find ministers willing to fill positions. Number one reason pastors leave the ministry, church people are not willing to go the same direction and go as the pastors. Pastors believe God wants them to go in one direction, but the people are not willing to follow or change. And what reason I, I was reading that is what I'm finding among many pastors and in church members that they've just lost the passion for serving God and ministry. They just lost the passion. And so we looked a few weeks ago at finding happiness in an unhappy world. We looked last week at finding our way. This week, we're going to be looking at finding our passion. And the reason I say finding it because the cruel reality is this. Many have lost their passion. Not only the pastor, but even the church. Many are losing their passion for ministry. So I want us to look in Revelation chapter 2. We're not going to do Revelation 21 8. But let's look at Revelation 2. It says in verse 1, let's all stand as the line of the reading of God's word. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have per persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from this place. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. May it come alive with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. The church in Ephesus that that was written about in the second century did not even exist. We just recently did a study uh, of Ephesians and the church in Ephesus did not make it. So even in the first century, churches were having a very hard time making it because of the pressures of the world. And so what we're going to look this morning at how we can find a passion. The first thing we have to do is describe it. We have to know what it is. What is it to have a passion for serving the Lord? Uh, look in uh, Romans 12. You can look or you can just look up on the screen. Uh, this is from the easy to read version. It says, as you serve the Lord, work hard and don't be lazy. Be excited about serving Him. Be excited. Going in, uh, out of the community talking to people that no longer go to church and they just said, well, they, just, they just didn't feel anything about going. They didn't feel like they... Um, they went there and they came back home. There was nothing. They didn't feel this excitement. And that's what's happening. People have lost their passion for serving Jesus. And it could be a, a number of things. It could just be from discouragement going to church. And, uh, I remember the church I pastored in Arkansas. Uh, the church we were with, what I call the veterans, they've been there years. And we bring in new members. Uh, we come. And they would be discouraged by the veterans because they didn't, the, the, those who have been around a while didn't want the new ones doing anything. Because it, it's almost this older mentality, this is my church and we're going to do it the way we want it and no one else is going, including even the pastor, is going to change things. And, and so that, that's what happens many times. People get in the church, they're not uh, plugged in and used and therefore they leave. And it's a statistic says if a person comes, if they're not used within six weeks, 
they will never come back. And it's, so that's what happens. We, and so people lose their excitement. You're excited about, uh, I know even in sports, people are excited about their team. You know, if they invest so lot in the team, they, they watch it every week, and that's why I don't like fantasy football or fantasy, because then you're looking at all the teams, and you're rooting for individuals. Well, I mean, I'm a team person. I like rooting for my team. And no matter if it's good, good or bad, I'm rooting for it. And I believe people, just they're so distracted by all the things around them that it's hard for them to focus on serving the Lord. And especially if they're in church and things just aren't, you know, if they're not involved. Uh, let's look at the next slide. You may not be able to read that one. No, you can't. But the poster, uh, George Gallagher, a survey of 13,000 people in 130 countries. It is the only time he has taken a survey that could be considered more or less worldwide. It was a survey of people who used to go to church but no longer do. There were a number of questions in the survey. One of the questions asked, what would you, what would you need to do to happen for you to return to church? The number one answer was passion in the lives of the members and leaders. What people want to see is a fire, a zeal, and enthusiasm among Christians that make going to church meaningful. And many times you talk to the people that visited the church, and they said, we went there and everybody just seemed dead. So church members across the world have lost their passion. And they've lost that, according to this, that word zeal, they've lost their zeal. For certain the Lord. Look at Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 says his power will continue to grow and there will be a peace without end. This will establish him as a king sitting on David's throne and ruling his kingdom. He will rule with goodness and justice forever and ever. The strong love, that word, the zeal, that the Lord all powerful has for his people will make this happen. So Jesus has a zeal for us. He has a passion for us. So much that he came and died for us. He's committed to us. And that's what we, if we're going to find our passion, that's where it must begin. But we have to say, first of all, it's kind of like a, an addict. It's like an you know, alcoholic, uh, uh, someone's addicted to porn or whatever. They have first have to admit, I have a problem. Back in that first church, I, I had to admit, I'm burnt out. I have a problem. And so we have to describe the passion. I, 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 I don't have it anymore. If we're going to do something, we're going to find it. The next thing we want to see is you have to develop a passion. If you lost your passion, it's not just going to come back. It's not going to say, well, okay, today my, I'm a, my passion for the Lord is going to be increased. You have to start by developing it. It must be developed. Look at Romans 10. It says, I can assure you that they are deeply devoted to God, but their devotion is not based on true knowledge. In other words, there are a lot of people that have a head knowledge of the Lord, and we try sometimes to try to will ourselves out. I know God, I know who He is. But that doesn't bring about passion. Knowing scriptures, just knowing verses or knowing the, the lingo of the church or what have you, that's, that's not passion. It must be developed by a real personal relationship with the Lord that's ongoing day in, day out, no matter what's going on. In 2 Timothy 3, this is from the... Uh, um, the BBE uh, Basic Bible English uh, I think it's translation. Ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of what is true. So some people again just have this intellectual the passion, where's passion to come from? Does it come from the head? No, it's, it's the emotion. It comes from inside. It comes from the relationship with the Holy Spirit working in us. That's where our passion is developed. It's spending time with the one we love. And that's where our, our passion comes from. In 2 Peter 1, 
Verse 2 says, May grace and peace ever be increasing in you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, because by His power He has given us everything necessary for life and righteousness through the knowledge of Him who has been our guide by His glory and virtue. In uh, the King James Version, with, in Genesis, it says, Adam knew his wife. Does that mean Adam knew his wife's name? No, it means they had an intimate relationship. It was a physical relationship, but it was intimate. But they were emotionally tied to one another. And that's what it means. We have to have this intimate not a sexual relationship, but an intimate relationship with God. It's not, it goes beyond just reading Scripture. But it's realizing that when you're reading the Word, it's alive. He's alive. And we're emotionally and spiritually invested in a relationship with Him. It's ongoing. We're, we're speaking, or he, we're reading His Word, we realize He's speaking to us, and then we speak back to Him. We spend time with Him. That's how we develop this passion. And 2 Peter 1, continuing verse 4 says, And through this he has given us the hope of great rewards highly to be valued, so that by them we might have a part in God's being and be made free from the destruction which is in the world through the desires of the flesh. So we want to develop that. We want to develop that. Passion. It just it doesn't just come. It takes work. It takes work if we're going to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. So once we have discovered, you know, understand what passion is, the fact that we've lost it, then we start developing it. And one of the ways to develop it is to demonstrate. It's actually to put it in action. Put it into practice. And Philippians 4, 8, it talks about you know, uh, about our relationship with God and, and understanding Him and knowing Him. But then it finally says, whatever's true, lovely, admirable, all the way then, the very thing it says, I believe, in verse 9, it says, put it into practice. Put into practice what we know about God. How, how much we love Him, how much we, we just enjoy being with Him. And what happens when we demonstrate this passion for the Lord is, is it overflows into our relationships with other people. They just know it. They just know that you have a relationship with them. In Matthew, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 36, says this. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were distressed and scattered as sheep not having a shepherd. Remember the verse we read in Isaiah? It said that God had a zeal for us, a, a passion for us. When we have a passion for someone, it moves beyond this passion to compassion. We love them, then we see their need. God gave us two commands, love God, love people. And if we begin to, to develop a relationship with God, it will overflow in our relationship with other people. And we have to understand the church is not about building, it's about people. And so we start demonstrating that love to people. In fact, it says in Romans 5, that God demonstrated his own love for us is that he died for us. He just didn't say, I love you. He showed that he loved us. And that's how we, we want to demonstrate our passion. We need to fall in love with the Lord. And then we fall in love with people. Look in Colossians uh, 1. I believe it's verse 3. It says this. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. Look at this. Love for all of God's people. Faith and love that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven and, ab and about, which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. 
In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it is, it has, it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learn it from the from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ and on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Look at this thing. Paul had his great love for the Lord. And because of that, it overflowed in love for people. And the way that it was demonstrated is that he began to pray. One thing that I have noticed from time to time in you know, different churches that I've been in is there's not always a deep love for one another in the church. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of division in churches, a lot of conflict in churches, and a lot of it's, it's, it's kind of maneuvers for power or whatever. But he says in this word that we need to love each other and the way that's demonstrated is through praying for them and spending time with them. Paul said, I can't, can't wait to see you. He can't wait to hear about them. Do we have that kind of passion for people? That we love them? We pray for them? We want to help them when, when they're in distress or in trouble? That's, that's what we need to develop. If we say, well, you know, I, I don't have it the way I used to have it. And that's what it says there in Revelation. You used to have it. You used to have a love for winning souls. You used to have a love for the church. You had a love for the Lord, but it goes. That's why we need to redevelop, rediscover it, begin to work on it. And if it's something that's just as simple as daily, Spending some time, I mean, there's so many, so many devotions you can find online. And you can buy devotional books, but spend some time in God's Word and then begin to pray for people. Make a list, pray for them, develop this passion for people. When they hurt, you hurt. That's what he's saying. If we want to rekindle it, bring it back. We may have lost that first love, but it can be restored. Father, we thank you, and we praise you for your word. And Father, from time to time, it's kind of like that old song, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. prone to leave the God I love. Father, we're like that. We get so distracted by what's going on in our world, whether it's sickness or whether it's financial issues, whether it's relationships at, at, at our job or what have you, it's, it sometimes just overwhelms us. That Father, we sometimes forget about that relationship with you. Forgive us. Help us, Lord, to stir up the gift that's within us. Help us to stir up the passion that we have with you and with others and develop a compassion for people. Looking at the people around us as lost so that we may tell them the good news. Father, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we receive the offering, uh, do we have, let's just spend some time in prayer. Do we have anyone that we need to be praying for uh, this morning, praying about you? Same place? No. Oh, you went for a new place? So you got a new job. Yeah. 